people's daily struggle to survive in an empty and hospitable land. In this documentary, we will travel to the heart of the Western Sahara, the last remaining unexplored region of the Great African Desert. We'll meet the nomads that inhabit this land, learn about their fascinating customs, their atavistic rites, the birthplace of an ancient empire. They are the Ulad El Mithna, the children of the cloud. The immense desert which comprises the Western Sahara, almost 250,000 kilometers in size, is one of the least known and most hostile regions in the world. Part of the Great African Granite Shield, the terrain is frequently interrupted by abrupt elevations, the remains of ancient volcanic chimneys and cones, which left behind solidified flows of basalt rock, giving these butts their characteristic black color. The granite outcrops of the original land formation suffer the continuous bombardment of particles of sand transported by the Sirocco, called Erifi, which in time has modeled the rocks into strange, fantastic shapes. The relief of this land, essentially a vast plain, is sharply interrupted by clusters of mountains. Erosion, due to the effect of thermoclasia, has caused the surface layer of the mountains to fracture and break apart, making landslides and subsidence a constant threat. The granite massif of Le Jouad, known by the desert nomads as the Mountains of the Devil, has given rise to all kinds of legends and superstitions, creating around it a halo of mystery. The great chains of dunes called ergs are the most characteristic feature of the Saharan landscape. Formed by the erosion grain by grain of the rocks, they acquire their characteristic half-moon shape, advancing and constantly transformed by the action of the wind. Terminal plateau covered in pebbles called hamadas are battered day and night by the wind. Scorched by the blazing sun, they are one of the most starkly beautiful landscapes of the desert. The main colonies of plant life are concentrated in the wadis, the dried up river courses. This is in part due to the morning fogs which form in winter, providing the vegetation with much needed humidity. The bush species that can be found in the wadis have managed to adapt to the extreme conditions of aridity and evaporation, pushing their roots down deep into the ground until they reach the water table. As the air close to the ground heats up, it gives rise to a strange phenomenon of refraction, causing spectacular mirages to appear on the wide plains. Impossible rivers and lakes rise up in the desert. It has not rained for over a year in the Western Sahara. On the Tiris Plains in the past praised for their pasture, the ground is parched and cracking, and the cattle are dying. The prolonged drought, which is afflicting this part of the planet, a consequent of the anticyclones which prevent the formation of clouds, is drying out the few wells, vital for the survival of the desert dwellers and their animals. At last, these storms arrive and bring with them the longed-for waters. 
They are sporadic and fall torrentially, flooding the wadis. In just a few days, pools and wetlands bring renewed life to the dying land. The desert dons a mantle of green. The time of abundance has arrived. Today is an important day for Habi Yabi and Fatima Du. They are expecting a very special visit. Their guests who have come from a great distance are two old friends, Sibidi Rahim and Kaloha. This interview was prepared well in advance. The reason is to settle the final details of the marriage, which is to take place between Sukraina, the daughter of the hosts, and Shelech, their friend's son. <laughs> With the good prospects promised by the recent rains, it has been decided that this marriage, so long postponed, will now take place. After the lengthy ritual greeting, which may last several minutes, at the entrance to the Haima, they drink the tea and goat's milk which is offered to all the guests. Both men are sheikhs, chiefs of family clans of great repute. In the Western Sahara, they are called bidanes. In traditional culture, this concept is associated with a man of Arab race who has his own herd of camels and servants to look after them. Given their important social position, the marriage they are arranging will be a great event, celebrated in the traditional manner. After drinking the three teas of welcome, the two friends retire to discuss and settle the final details of the marriage. Most important of all is the dowry, which is to be given to the bride's family. It is also a good time to talk about the favorite subject of all nomads, their livestock. The recent rains have brought abundant pasture. The herds of dromedaries can spend the entire day chomping on the young shoots of eskef, their favorite food. They need to recover the weight loss during the long drought. Small herds of goats also accompany the nomads of the Sahara. Because it is perfectly adapted to the surroundings, the goat has become one of the main domesticated animals in these regions. The dromedary was introduced into Africa in the 6th century BC, and since then it has become the very essence of the Sahara, earning the name the Ship of the Desert. Its extraordinary characteristics mean it can drink salt water or go for long periods without drinking at all, losing up to 25% of its body mass. It can recover this lost mass by consuming at a single time up to 90 liters of water, which it will store in different sacks in its stomach. At the well of Aiguanit in the south of the country, the herds of many tribes have gathered. The dromedary is the principal agent and the basis of wealth in the transhumanist economy of the Western Sahara. During this time of rain, the females will be mounted by the stud camel, and those that are pregnant will give birth after a gestation period of 14 months. The newborn camel is called the lejwa. They are born with a covering of whitish wool which immediately protects them from the intense heat. 
A herdsman unties a shmal, which protects the udders of the female camels, so their young have access to the nutritious milk. Lactation is controlled so that the mother is not excessively weakened. Traditionally, each tribe brands its camels with a distinctive mark, recognizable to anyone who finds them if they stray off. The easy domestication of the dromedary, called Imel in the Western Sahara, and its resistance to the desert conditions have made this animal the perfect companion for the Bedouins of the Sahara who obtain meat, milk, and skins from it. Since ancient times, the nomads have used camel skin to make equipment and utensils they use in their daily lives. After several hours to allow the animals to drink, they begin preparations to lead the herds to the pastures in the south along the Mauritanian border. Ahead of them lies a tough, demanding march, and the recently born young have to be transported on the camel's backs along with the luggage. It is over 150 kilometers to the next well and the pasture left by the recent rain clouds. After a long discussion, Habe Yabi and Sidi Ibrahim have now agreed on the amount of the dowry which must be high as benefits two families of their rank. In reality, this marriage was agreed many years ago when their respective children were still very young. This union is in the interest of both families which boast very ancient important lineages. In this way they create ties which will be invaluable in cases of extreme necessity. The marriage is held at the well of Miyek in the middle of the desert as required by tradition. <laughs> Sidi Ibrahim and Galoa have to inform all their friends and relatives. Some lead a nomadic life in Mauritania, but the majority live in the camps of Tinduf. In 1976, exile began for the Sahrawi nation, which since then has been crowded into refugee camps in the barren Hamada of Tinduf, in extreme living conditions and depending for the survival on international aid. The unequal war between the Polisario Front and Morocco in order to achieve freedom for the country has led to poverty, desolation, and an unbearable cost in human lives. The resolutions of the United Nations regarding the holding of a referendum on self-determination of the Sahrawi people have still not been put into practice 25 years after Spain, the colonial power, abandoned these people to the mercy of their aggressive neighbors. At the end of the 19th century, at the height of the colonial frenzy, Fish factories from the Canary Islands and explorers such as Cervera and Bonelli were already claiming this territory for the Spanish crown. In exile, the Sahrawi nation has, with a few available resources, managed to create a rudimentary but efficient system of administration. The population, some 170,000 people, has organized itself into wilayas and darias, assemblies of neighbors at which they discuss the problems of the community. That is how, day by day, they struggle against the tragic destiny which has confined them in these ghettos of sand and stone. The tenacious work of the men and women who live here has provided these camps with better services. Nonetheless, everything here is fragile, precarious. The mud houses they spend so much time and effort building on any piece of flat land are more comfortable and provide greater protection than the tents donated by the United Nations. 
But when the torrential rain pours down, they crumble like sandcastles. And so, like Penelope at her loom, they have to constantly work on restoration and maintenance. Even in such extreme conditions, life goes on. Relatives and guests start arriving at Hakim's house for the baptism of his eldest son. Today is an important day. The women enter the small room where the mother, who gave birth seven days ago, is lying with her son. Following Saharawi tradition, the name of the child is chosen by the luck of the sticks. Each date tree branch has the name of a male of the family or friends. The mother-in-law puts them into goat's or camel's milk, and the mother chooses one. This process is repeated three times, and the name assigned to the stick chosen will from then on be the name of the newborn child. A baptism is always an occasion for celebration and rejoicing. Hakim has good reason to be happy. A male child will carry on his name and that of his family. And naturally, there must be food in abundance for all the relatives and friends who want to join the celebration. On this day, no expense will be spared. In the Sahara, it is still possible to find some artisans practicing traditional crafts, exactly the way they were described in the 1950s by the eminent anthropologist Julio Caro Baroja. Today there are very few left, but in the past the artisans called malimim, or pejoratively majareros, were an essential part of everyday life in a nomad encampment. In the most important and most opulent fargan, the artisan and his itinerant workshop occupied a very special place. His haima was a place for idle gossip and amorous intrigues. Though traditional Saharawi society looked down on them, the majarero and his wife made everyday utensils, both of wood or leather and bone or metal. From their expert hands came the saddles and the cauldrons and pitchers made of copper and brass. Also finely worked caskets and boxes which conferred a certain prestige on their owners. Small tents and family businesses like this one of Mahayub have proliferated in the camps of Tinduf, a sign of improvements in the refugees' quality of life. This budding capitalism is replacing the traditional system of commerce based on barter which the new generations born in exile have never known. The majority of the products sold here are brought from Mauritania. In particular, the fabrics for the women and the darras for the men are highly prized. So gradually and as yet timidly, money is beginning to circulate, providing stimulus to the young who have no other way of earning a living. The darra is the traditional male dress in the Western Sahara and Mauritania. Though now they are machine-stitched, traditionally the complicated designs around the neck were embroidered by hand. The more intricately decorated the gathering, the more valuable it is. These designs are always asymmetrical and made with linen thread. The darra reflected the rank and power of its owner. The final preparations are being made for the journey of Lejbib and his wife to the Miyek well, where the marriage is to be held. Two black women, descendants of slaves, put the women's saddle on the camel. In the Western Sahara, slavery was abolished during Spanish rule. 
However, this practice continued to be frequent among the Bidanis. The Frente Polisario, or Polisario Front, finally put an end to the system of castes and servitude. The saddle for women, called an Amshamagab, is in reality a palanquin, with fabrics and cushions on which the woman can travel in comfort with her small children. The bridegroom's family and their guests are starting to arrive at the frick of Sukaina's family. With them they bring many camels. Some of these form part of the agreed dowry, but others are mere ostentation to impress the bride's family. The friends and relatives of the two families compete against each other, raising large black and white cloths in the wind. This challenge is in reality one of the many games played by the young during wedding celebrations. When the two groups stand opposite each other, they try to pull down the other's cloth in a struggle from which violence is not entirely absent. This game of fighting for the cloth is of uncertain origin, its roots going back to the primitive Berber tribes that inhabit in this region. The original Berber tribes came from the north to settle here over 3,000 years ago. On the rocks they have left behind enigmatic inscriptions whose meaning is still not known. They raised megalithic monuments and funeral tumuli across the entire Saharan region, evidence of a complex cosmic vision, a magic universe in which the afterlife played an important part. Proof that the Western Sahara was inhabited in ancient times can be seen in the petroglyphs of the important Paleolithic site of Sluguija. Now extinct fauna can be seen on hundreds of stone blocks in the open air expertly sculpted using the system of incision and scraping. But perhaps the best guarded treasures of the primitive art of the Sahara are the paintings at Erka Eitz, just a few kilometers from the Tifariti site. These paintings are found in natural shelters called Tafonis along the Legasem mountains, whose gullies and ravines can only be reached with the help of an expert with excellent knowledge of the local terrain. Little by little we leave the plain behind and enter a different landscape, rugged and primal. Lut has cooperated with certain universities on the study and protection of the world heritage. However, the precarious state of some of these paintings and the rapacity of certain visitors do not bode well for their conservation. They belong to the Epipaleolithic and Neolithic periods between 7,000 and 4,000 years before Christ painted with natural pigments and animal fat as a binding agent. They depict everyday scenes in a society of hunter-gatherers before the last great drought turned their prairies and savannas into barren lands. The iconography of Erkayets shows us groups of people in attitudes of dancing, stalking or pasturage, along with magnificent figures of bovines which they must have started to domesticate by that time.
However, the most important illustrations in this open-air museum are the paintings of wild animals now extinct, which tells us of a very different Sahara from that we now see, with herds of antelopes and giraffes roaming across the savanna. For these first inhabitants, the giraffe must have been a totemic animal, as it is the most frequently depicted motif. Another important figure is the two-colored dama gazelle, now no longer to be found in the Sahara. Much the same could be said of the Dorcas gazelle, like this one held by an old Polisario soldier. Not long ago, they were abundant in this country, but now they have virtually been wiped out. This desolate, abrupt terrain is the kingdom of the reptiles, of which there are over 100 species. Some, like the fringe-toed lizard, can tolerate internal temperatures of up to 50 degrees centigrade. The majority of these reptiles live beneath ground to escape from the daytime heat, and they have developed complicated adaptive mechanisms. Of all the different types of snakes that live in this region, the most feared is the lefa or horn viper. It is the main predator in the area, feeding essentially on gerbils and small rodents. The nasal protuberances in the form of horns, incredibly sensitive to temperature, allow the snake to detect the presence of warm-blooded prey. But if the Western Sahara is called the land of the lizards, it is above all due to the abundance of this reptile with its characteristic thorny tail. There are many stories and legends around these emblematic lizards which are hunted for the nomad children to play with them, and traditional medicine attributes them with an endless list of virtues. The vegetable kingdom is characterized by its adaptation to the extreme aridity of the environment. The bushes and higher plants can be found dotted along the wadis. The grasses, such as the burro weed, though they are inedible for humans, are highly prized for their medicinal applications. The Talha or Sahara Nakasha is the most representative tree of this desert and has adapted by reducing its size. The leaves have turned into thorns and the flowers are button shaped to prevent evaporation. The resin is also used in the pharmacopoeia of the nomads. The dried skins of different reptiles, woods and seeds which are believed to have curative properties are sold at open-air stalls in the cities of Mauritania. In this society, traditional healers have always been treated with great respect and deference such as Kertum, a renowned healer woman who learned her craft from her forefathers. On this occasion, she is preparing a potion for a neighbor who is pregnant and fears she may have a miscarriage. The basic ingredients are branches of atil, date oil, and other products which she herself gathers in the desert. After macerating for a number of hours, all that's left is to add a pinch of talja leaves and leave the potion to settle. The Western Sahara may appear to bear a barren, lifeless land, but since ancient times, it has provided the ingredients necessary to prepare potions and ointments which the Saharawis have used to treat their ailments. In the frick where the wedding is to be held, there is a festive atmosphere. 
The young constantly shout and run around, and the mood proves infectious to even the most venerable elders. Some show off their riding skills to impress the girls of marriageable age. Meanwhile, the utensils, carpets, and blankets which will decorate the bridegroom's haima are unloaded from the camels. In traditional Saharawi weddings, the bridegroom has a separate, richly decorated haima, where, in the company of his friends, he waits for events to get underway. The last guests to arrive are Lejbib and his wife, who set out from Mauritania several days ago. They are received with demonstrations of general joy and rejoicing. Lejbib is a relative on the bride's side and enjoys well-deserved respect for his skill as a slaughterman. Tomorrow, the day of the wedding, he'll have the opportunity to demonstrate this skill. Before sunrise, the slaughterman, aided by a few men, will sacrifice the camel to be eaten by all the guests. First, the obligatory ablutions facing Mecca. Then, with a steady hand, he proceeds to slit the throat of the animal held immobile by his assistants. With two precise cuts of the knife, he slices through the aorta, killing the camel in a matter of seconds. Acting fast, the men tear back the thick skin of the animal, revealing the fat reserve stored by the camel in its hump. It is customary among the nomads to cut off a piece of this and eat it as a tasty appetizer. <laughs> In the Sahara, it is very important to know how to efficiently slaughter an animal as valuable as the camel, which can only be eaten on very special occasions. An average family owns only a few female camels. The males fetch much higher prices. For the nomads, the raw liver is the most exquisite delicacy. They believe that this valuable source of proteins gives them strength and virility. In just a few hours, virtually the entire animal has been cut up. They have to work fast. In this climate, the heat will rapidly rot the dead body. The women of the camp come to collect their portions. Today, there is plenty of meat for everyone. An animal weighing 400 kilos, of which nothing is wasted, provides food for a great many people. Some pieces of meat are hung from the lektub, the guy ropes of the haima, to be dried for later storage. In the parents' tent, the Nehar el Arad, the marriage contract is being formalized. The parents of the bride and groom with a shahed, or witness for each family, are gathered in the presence of the Qadi, the justice of the peace, who will give legal validity to the union. <laughs> the Qadi is always a man of honor, venerable and of proven religiosity, belonging to the aristocratic caste of the Zuwaya, men of the book who never perform manual work. Men and women sit together drinking camel's milk from the same bowl. In Sahrawi society, this is interpreted as a gesture of friendship. 
Lekari reads out the conditions of the contract and asks the parents and the witnesses if they are in agreement. Outside, the women expectantly follow what is going on inside. Inside the Haima, the Kadi attest that the trousseau and the cattle of the Dari are as agreed between the parents and then, along with his assistants, recites the Quranic precepts which will govern the marriage. <laughs> Islam was introduced into the Sahar in the 8th century by tribes from Arabia. The dominant variety is Sunni of the Maleki rite. Since then, the Taleb or master of the Quran has taught children from 5 to 13 years old the rudiments of writing and how to recite by memory the verses written in the Laoj or Quranic tables in return for a small stipend in the form of cattle. In the Sahara, the Taleb were also men of the book, the governing class, and enjoyed certain privileges. For the Sahari nomad, the emptiness of this immense desert makes mysticism and dialogue with God easier to achieve. The wedding ceremony is still important in traditional society, maintained despite the now sedentary lifestyle the Saharawi people have been forced to adopt. <laughs> The Qadi, after recording in writing that none of the participants in the ceremony have raised any objection, confirms that the act is legal and the marriage valid. <laughs> the cries of joy from the women watching spread the news of the union to the entire freak. <laughs> <laughs> but it is one of the witnesses who makes the official announcement, firing shots into the air with an old Mauser gun. This characteristic howl of the Sahrawi women called Inshid is a public manifestation of joy, which they also made when the warriors went into combat. <laughs> When the requirements of the Quran and tradition have been fulfilled, the women serve large trays of isan, camel meat with rice. The eagerly awaited banquet has finally begun, and it must be as copious as possible to demonstrate the generosity of the bride's family, who are the hosts. <laughs> In accordance with custom, the men and women eat separately. Some traditional customs still remain, though they now form part of the past. The old tribal divisions of nobles, descendants of Yemeni Arabs, tributary tribes and slaves. The drums and music sound out in the desert. After the copious feast, Shelech, the bridegroom, accompanied by the Ausir, his inseparable companion, other friends and some divorced women, goes round his own Haima three times in a ritual to ward off any spell or evil eye, which is a very deep-rooted belief in the Sahara. <laughs> Meanwhile, in another tent, Sukaina, the bride, is pretending to hide. The women of her family are making her up with nila and henna powders. <laughs> Shelikh is being given advice on how to behave in his marriage. His friends tell him they are ready to go in search of the bride whenever he asks them to. Finally, they enter the haima to join the party.
The entertainment is provided by an Igawen, a minstrel who plays the traditional tidinit, the four-stringed lute of Mauritanian origin with which he accompanies these love poems the Saharawis are so fond of. The hypnotic harmonies of the whole music transport the imagination to the beautiful lands of Mauritania. Mauritania, the land of which since ancient times a thousand poets have sung, the country of the Bidanis and of the Adra Tma, the fabulous mountains of sweet dates. These lonely escarpments hide some of the most jealously guarded treasures of the great Sahara Desert. For as long as anyone can remember, the nomads have come to these oases to rest and escape from the burning heat, small islands of intense green and babbling waters. The oasis of Teriyit is home to some of the most important endemic plant species, such as the Saharan fern. In the crystalline waters that gush from the spring live inexplicably dozens of small fish, true living fossils from the time when rivers flowed across this desert. In the Mauritanian Adrar, one of the most spectacular phenomena in the world can be found. This is Nguelb el Richat, a gigantic primitive volcano, the enormous size of which can only be appreciated from the air. Mauritania is a country entirely of desert and with a fascinating history. The terrifying canyons of the Amogia ravine, its vertical walls and the frequent landslides form part of the dangers of the road which the ancient caravans had to negotiate in order to reach the mythical cities of the Gold Route, the lost cities of Mauritania. Wadan, the legendary city of palm groves and its mysterious founders, the Bafu, who trained dogs for war and were great musicians. To Wadan came the caravans of thousands of dromedaries from the Black Kingdom of Ghana, with slaves, gold and shellac, to exchange them for the salt in Wadanese mined in the Esebja of Ilil. In these lands, the fierce Almoravid warriors conceived their epic plan of creating a vast African empire, which would stretch from the river Niger to the shores of the Ebro in Al-Andalus. They brought together all the tribes of the Sahara under the flag of the most orthodox Islam. The city, formerly rich thanks to its immense palm groves, stands in the center of the Turab al-Bidan, the land of the white men, the natural frontier with black Africa. Like all the great cities along the caravan routes, Wadan, before its final decline as a result of the internal struggles which laid it to waste in the 18th century, was an important center for the dissemination of culture. Today all that remain are the ruins of the once bustling city. It is virtually deserted, its former prosperity now reduced to the very image of desolation. The other great caravan center in the Adrar of Mauritania is Chingeti. According to popular belief, it was founded by the Almoravids, though studies have suggested it was of later construction. Like Wadan, it is in a lamentable state of conservation, despite the funds donated by UNESCO in order to preserve it. 
The mosque is the most important building in Cinghetti and perhaps in all of Mauritania. Every year, below its minaret of dry stone masonry and reconstructed several times, thousands of the Turab al Bidan faithful gathered to set out on the pilgrimage to Mecca. For this reason, Cinghetti was considered the seventh holy city of Islam. The precarious state of the city is due to the inexorable advance of the desert and the circle of encroaching dunes which are slowly burying it forever. So the people abandon the homes which empty and unattended in time simply crumble. The few inhabitants that still remain are elusive and the streets are empty. It is, to all intents and purposes, a ghost town. Only the odd craft store, where you can now buy a family's most treasured memories, reminds us of the former splendor of Cinghetti, once the source of all erudition and knowledge in Mauritania. The celebration continues with the music of the Tindinit and the poems recited in Hassania, the Arab dialect brought here from distant Yemen by the Beni Hassan tribe in the 18th century. On a sign from the bridegroom, his best friends go out to look for the bride, who presumably is hidden in some haima. This is what they call the Agla, the rescue dance, a tacit game in which the bride has to pretend she does not want to get married, and so hides with the help of her friends. In this way, she reaffirms her purity and chastity. It is said that in the past, some brides hid so well that they died of heat and exhaustion beneath the implacable Saharan sun. Between bursts of nervous laughter, the young bride jokes with her friends and cousins who are putting the final touches to her makeup. The bridegroom starts to become impatient. If his friends take too long, he will have to go out and search for her himself. Sukaina is now ready. Her friends place a white cloth over her head a sign of virginity. Among her friends, there is frequently a divorced woman, not at all unusual in the Western Sahara, where women do not suffer the same oppression as in other parts of Africa. In the bridegroom's haima, the beat of the drums accentuates the weight. Shelig's friends must carry off the bride, even if this means fighting against her relatives who will try to stop them. Tired of waiting, Shelig decides to go out in search of his bride. In his haima, the dancing is now becoming frenetic. The electrifying rhythm of the drums awakes the latent atavistic instincts of the Saharawi nomad, and they dance wild, suggestively sensual dances. Most violently, the bride is dragged to the tent of the man who is now her husband. No one will now doubt the virility of Shelley. <laughs> Not everyone takes part in these celebrations. Tufa wants to know if she'll be the next to get married. So she goes to a black woman who will read her future, using the art of Legsana. <laughs> This divining consists of reading the future in balls of camel dung into which small sticks have been pushed. The position in which they fall indicates what the future holds. The Saharari society is very superstitious and despite the explicit prohibition by their religion, believes in dreams, spells and the power of amulets. <laughs> On this occasion, fortune has smiled on Tufa. The balls of excrement have fallen with the sticks pointing up, which is interpreted to mean she will soon find a husband. When 
When the bride and groom are in the same chayma, they are considered to be properly married. Then the guests become uninhibited and for hours on end dance explicitly erotic dances. Men and women lose their inhibitions, intoxicated by the rhythmic sound of the drums. Shelig's young wife sits at her husband's side, her head covered with a black cloth to indicate she is no longer single. The dance of these nomads is an expression of their determination to one day live in a Sahara free from foreign occupation. Through marriage they seek to perpetuate the lineage, preserve their collective memory. Today this is perhaps the only light in the long dark night of the Saharawi people.